The Idealist by Arthur Mekin. Did you notice Simons while Beaver was telling that story just now? said one clerk to the other. No. Why? Didn't he like it? The second clerk had been putting away his papers and closing his desk in a grave and business-like manner, but when Beaver's story was recalled to him, he began to bubble anew, tasting the relish of the tale for a second time. He's a fair scorcher, old Beaver, he remarked between little gasps of mirth, but didn't Simons like it? Like it? He looked disgusted, I can tell you. Made a face, something in this style, and the man drew his features into a design of sour disapproval as he gave his hat the last polish with his coat sleeve. Well, I'm off now, he said. I want to get home early, as there's tart for tea. And he fashioned another grimace in imitation of his favorite actor's favorite contortion. Well, goodbye, said his friend. You're a hot un you are. You're worse than beaver. See you on Monday. What will Simon say? And he shouted after him as the door swung to and fro. Charles Simons, who had failed to see the humor of Mr. Beaver's tale, had left the office a few minutes earlier and was now pacing slowly westward, mounting Fleet Street. His fellow clerk had not been much amiss in his observation. Simons had heard the last phrases of Beaver's story and unconsciously had looked half round towards the group, angry and disgusted at their gross and stupid merriment. Beaver and his friends seemed to him guilty of sacrilege. He likened them to ploughboys pawing and deriding an exquisite painted panel, blaring out their contempt and brutal ignorance. He could not control his features. In spite of himself, he looked loathing at the three yahoos. He would have given anything if he could have found words and told them what he thought, but even to look displeasure was difficult. His shyness was a perpetual amusement to the other clerks, who often did little things to annoy him, and enjoyed the spectacle of Simon's inwardly raging and burning like Etna, but too hopelessly diffident to say a word. He would turn dead man's white, and grind his teeth at an insult, and pretend to join in the laugh, and pass it off as a joke. When he was a boy, his mother was puzzled by him, not knowing whether he were sullen or insensible, or perhaps very good-tempered. He climbed Fleet Street, still raw with irritation, partly from a real disgust at the profane coarseness of the clerks, and partly from a feeling that they talked so because they knew he hated such gross farces and novels. It was hideous to live and work with such foul creatures, and he glanced back fury at the city, the place of the stupid, the blatant, the intolerable. He passed into the rush and flood of the Strand, into the full tide of a Saturday afternoon, still meditating the outrage and constructing a cutting sentence for future use, heaping up words which should make Beaver tremble. He was quite aware that he would never utter one of these biting phrases, but the pretense soothed him, and he began to remember other things. It was late in November, and the clouds were already gathering for the bright solemnity of the sunset, flying to their places before the wind. They curled into fantastic shapes, high up there in the wind's whirlpool, and Simon's, looking towards the sky, was attracted by two grey, writhing clouds that drew together in the west, in the far perspective of the strand. He saw them as if they had been living creatures, noting every change and movement and transformation, till the shaking winds made them one and drove a vague form away to the south. The curious interest he had taken in the cloud shapes had driven away the thought of the office, and the fetid talk which he so often heard. Beaver and his friends ceased to exist, and Simons escaped to his occult and private world, which no one had ever divined. He lived far away, down in Fulham, but he let the buses rock past him, and walked slowly, endeavoring to prolong the joys of anticipation. Almost with a visible gesture, he drew himself apart and went solitary, his eyes downcast, and gazing not on the pavement, but on certain clear imagined pictures. He quickened his steps as he passed along the northern pavement of Leicester Square, hurrying to escape the sight of the enameled strange spectra who were already beginning to walk and stir abroad, issuing from their caves and waiting for the gaslight. He scowled as he looked up and chanced to see on a hoarding an icon with rattled cheeks and grinning teeth, at which some young men were leering, 
and one was recalling this creature's great song. And that's the way they do it. How do you think it's done? Oh, that's the way they do it. Doesn't it take the bon? Simons scowled at the picture of her, remembering how Beaver had voted her good goods, how the boys bellowed the chorus under his windows of Saturday nights. Once he had opened the window as they passed by, and had sworn at them and cursed them, in a whisper, lest he should be overheard. He peered curiously at the books in a Piccadilly shop. Now and then, when he could save a few pounds, he had made purchases there, but the wares which the bookseller dealt in were expensive, and he was obliged to be rather neatly dressed at the office, and he had other esoteric expenses. He had made up his mind to learn Persian, and he hesitated as to whether he should turn back now and see if he could pick up a grammar book in Great Russell Street at a reasonable price. But it was growing dark, and the mists and shadows that he loved were gathering and inviting him onwards to those silent streets near the river. When he at last diverged from the main road, he made his way by a devious and eccentric track, threading an intricate maze of streets which to most people would have been dull and gloomy and devoid of interest. But to Simons, these backwaters of London were as bizarre and glowing as a cabinet of Japanese curios. He found here his delicately chased bronzes, work in jade, the flush and flame of extraordinary colors. He delayed at a corner, watching a shadow on a lighted blind, watching it fade and blacken and fade, conjecturing its secrets, inventing dialogues for this drama in ombre chinois. He glanced up at another window, and saw a room vivid in a hard yellow light of flaming gas, and lurked in the shelter of an old elm till he was perceived and the curtains were drawn hastily. On the way he had chosen, it was his fortune to pass many well-ordered decent streets, by villas detached and semi-detached, half hidden behind flowering shrubs and evergreens. At this hour, on a Saturday in November, few were abroad, and Simons was often able crouching down by the fence, to peer into a lighted room, to watch persons who thought themselves utterly unobserved. As he came near to his home, he went through meaner streets, and he stopped at a corner, observing two children at play, regarding them with the minute scrutiny of an entomologist at the microscope. A woman who had been out shopping crossed the road and drove the children home, and Simons moved on, hastily, but with a long sigh of enjoyment. His breath came quick, in gusts, as he drew out his latchkey. He lived in an old Georgian house, and he raced up the stairs and locked the door of the great lofty room in which he lived. The evening was damp and chilly, but the sweat streamed down his face. He struck a match, and there was a strange momentary vision of the vast room, almost empty of furniture, a hollow space bordered by grave walls and the white glimmer of the corniced ceiling. He lit a candle, opened a large box that stood in a corner, and set to work. He seemed to be fitting together some sort of lay figure, a vague hint of the human shape increased under his hands. The candle sparkled at the other end of the room, and Simons was sweating over his task in a cavern of dark shadow. His nervous, shaking fingers fumbled over that uncertain figure, and then he began to draw out incongruous, monstrous things. In the dusk, white silk shimmered, laces and delicate frills hovered for a moment, as he bungled over the tying of knots, the fastening of bands. The old room grew rich, heavy, vaporous with subtle scents. The garments that were passing through his hands had been drenched with fragrance. Passion had contorted his face. He grinned stark in the candlelight. When he had finished the work, he drew it with him to the window, and lighted three more candles. In his excitement, for that night he forgot the effect of ombre chinoise, and those who passed and happened to look up at the white staring blind, found singular matter for speculation.